talk about this last um, kind of year and a half, two years, where you go, you basically shave a minute off your pace. So you're running mid seven minute pace to down to mid six minute pace. First off, going back to the you know the guy who uh, you know blew up at London and you know five hours. Yeah. Ask him like or tell him like what would he have told you had you said, Hey, stick with this, we're gonna be running six thirty miles for twenty six miles, what would he have told you? He would have laughed. <laughs> 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 Get the hell out of here. I'm trying to use words of Eddie swearing, so yeah. I'm trying to keep it clean. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty remarkable. I mean that that, that really is a How's it going, Marcus? I'm good, thanks. How about yourself, Troy? I'm doing very, very well. On the uh, podcast today, we have Marcus Brown. Marcus, you're a busy guy. I was kind of tracking your bio and stuff. You're um, you're one of the founders of um, uh, the Black Trail Runners, which is a, a sort of an initiative to increase diversity in trail running over there in the UK. Um, you've got um, a couple of podcasts. I'm assuming you're involved in the in the Black Trail Runners podcast, but then you've also got um, – oh, I just lost my note here where I've been listening to it all break, all uh, holiday break here, uh, the Runner's Life podcast. There you go. Yeah. So, And then you're training for uh, some big runs. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks yeah. for taking some time out. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, when I heard number 25, I was always a little bit disappointed because I wanted to be, to be 26. Oh. Especially <laughs> <laughs> because of the marathons, but you can't do anything about it now. So. Oh, there you go. Well, you know, I can, I'll, I'll interview my mom or something in between. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just release a quick episode to put you on <laughs> to 26. <laughs> 26 point two. Yeah, brilliant. there you go. There you go. There you go. So um, you were connected to us. You're another um, really... Uh, the um, the Abbott World Marathon majors has been really good about kind of sending us some some great people to talk to, and so um, the folks over there connected us. And uh, you and I, we uh, the holidays sort of got in the way. We we had a quick chat to just kind of check in with one another, and then life got in the way with Christmas and uh, and some travel on my side, lockdown on your side, uh, being in London, and uh, so. Um, yeah, you're. Uh, you are. How many? How many stars are you into your um, into your marathon? Or did you get them all? I've got them all. You've got them all in 2018 right. at the infamous uh, Boston 2018. That's right. That was the final level. <laughs> <laughs> well, you saved the easiest for last, right? I know. <laughs> it's like God had a plan and thought, nope, we're going to give it all to you right now. How yeah. do you really want it? <laughs> How'd that day go for that was you? A tough one. <laughs> I had no choice really. I was out there, so um, and you it's a point to point, so I had to get back. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it was a tough day, but um, I got a then PR at the time, which was funny enough. Um, but yeah, it was an emotional finish, and uh, I was just glad to get it done. But I still feel like I've got unfinished business with Boston. So when things kind of re- resume to you know normality, well, well normality is obviously uh, you know word that you know can be sort of depends on how you look at it really but uh, at a time where we can go back to sort of mass participation in races you know I would love to go back to Boston and uh, kind of run it again yeah what what was what was the deal on the day there did it would like um, was it travel was it training was it course or well let's just let's talk about your day a little bit there because that was a that was a tough one for you it was a good day but it was a tough day yeah (laughs) Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was, it was a good day. It was just the weather. You know, we just had everything thrown at us. We had torrential rain, we had winds, it was, and obviously the wind chill, you know, drops the temperature quite a bit. So it was it was freezing. You're soaked, you're soaked through, your, your your shoes are wet, you know, your clothes are wet. And when you see the elites wearing, you know, jackets, then you know it's a cold day because yeah. usually people kind of go in the singlets or whatever. I think if you did that, you're a brave person. You're braver than me. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you're from London. That's like the, isn't that just kind of the, the typical weather right there? <laughs> <laughs> rain, but yeah, but right, it's, yeah. I mean, that was a different level of rain. I just, I, I don't know. I always sort of think now, I was sort of, that's like my barometer of like what rain is. I was like, is it Boston 2018 rain? Yeah. If it's not, then I'm like, that's fine. We can, you can run through it. 
Yeah, that's a that's a tough one when you're just trying to when you're just trying to survive. Miami was a bad race a few years back where there was a lot of wind and rain. It wasn't wasn't quite as cold by um you know, well, it was cold by Miami standards, but it wasn't quite as cold as Boston and there there was a lot of people who were suffering through that day. But that's kind of the beauty of, you know, marathoning and and doing these things that we love is there's uh Yeah. You know, you can only control what you can control, and there's always ten things that are going to jump up and bite you in the ass. So, yeah, I mean, to be honest, they did tell us it was going to be pretty terrible in the lead up beforehand. Yeah. So I kind of sat in my hotel room the days before and uh, actually planned out like all the worst case scenarios that could happen. Yeah. And so the funny thing is, like sometimes reality isn't as bad as your imagination. So <laughs> when I was out there, and it was raining and it was cold. Just like, well, I didn't expect this. Yeah. So it wasn't as bad as I as I thought, and you know, I think I just kind of really, you know, reduced my circle of what what I could control, like what I could focus on. I just really kept that that focus really small, and just really concentrated to put one foot in front of the other and took it to the end. It was just almost like you're in a trance, really. Yeah. And then you get to the end, you kind of wake up, you kind of missed a lot of the course, and um, just you're not really taking it all in because you're just literally just you just focusing on what you need to do. And you know, I, I, I really I think that really helped me that sort of practice beforehand. Um, but you know, I, that's why I would love to go back now just to try and, yeah. you know, to see the course and appreciate, you know, the people that are out there and supporting us. So, um, that, that's interesting. So to walk us through what you were thinking, you, you mentioned that you were kind of sitting in your hotel room going over the, the worst possible scenarios. How does that work for you? Are you thinking about like how you prepare your gear and those types of things where you're going to go like, you know, buy a rain jacket if you didn't have it or, or like how were you preparing yourself a bit both really so it's physical mental and obviously kit i didn't go out and buy any more kit because i thought well it's no don't wear something new you know we, we've all been told that so just yeah. don't do it and i had a jacket with me it wasn't i mean even if you had a rainproof jacket you would have got soaked anyway right. so um you know i had a jacket and i had some like gloves and a hat and all that kind of stuff so i, I put that on and I thought, okay, well, I've got the kit sorted out. Now it's just really just thinking about mentally, like what is going to happen at this particular time. And yeah, you just basically write down all the situations in terms of rain. What's what's going to happen if it gets really cold? What are you going to do? Or, or if this happens, what are you going to do? Yeah. And you just write a solution. Sometimes you haven't got a solution to it, but right. it's more about thinking about it and then at least trying to make the best next step. And that process just really helped me. And there's something I've really taken into training life of the marathons yeah was that something that you had always done are you a pretty cerebral um racer in that regard or um what did you just sort of um kind of strike you because the the weather was so bad i, I think probably more towards the latter but i think that's something i would do in my day-to-day -day job because i'm quite analytical in that way but Funny enough, I didn't really do any marathons before because I don't think the weather was as bad and didn't really call for that sort of action. But still, even if the weather's perfect, you should still prepare for good and bad and whatever. So, I mean, I've learned a lot from that. And, yeah, it was. Um, I think it's more the, the, the weather that really sort of forced my hand to, to do that, really. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 looking at, you know, I mean you ran a, a three twenty eight, as you said, it was your um it was your PR at the time. It was seven minutes better than Chicago the previous year. So you from from October to April twenty seven to twenty eighteen, you go from, you know, three thirty five um on a I think most would consider an easier course than Boston, and then you know, you shave seven minutes off with terrible rain and, and cold and, you know, heartbreak hill and everything else in it. So, uh, well done. It's funny how like a warm shower can really make you run fast. So <laughs> I was just thinking about getting back to the hotel room. <laughs> That's what you were picturing the whole time, huh? <laughs> I think towards the end, I think you just like, you just imagine that it's warm and, it, you know, just to kind of not pretend that it's not cold, but you just try and imagine a different situation just yeah. to keep you focused and moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. What um I mean you you know it's interesting because like your 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 profile I'm looking at here is like I mean you're kind of a you're like a six-star junkie in a way. I mean, it's like London Marathon, New York Marathon, Chicago, Boston, London again, New York. I mean, it's like you're um you got some great 
you know, great races on the, on the resume here. What, how did you get into, I mean, it almost seems like you kind of came out of nowhere in 2010, um, you know, went under five minutes at London and then, I don't know, caught the bug. You took an hour off the next year or the next time, the next marathon you ran at New York. How did you get into running yeah. marathons? I'll be honest, I still need to add some of my results onto the, yeah. to the site. So I think it doesn't have like uh, Toko, for example, but yeah, I think you make a good point. So basically back in 2010, it was the first experience of running the the World Marathon Majors. And that's before the Six Star became a thing. And that was, I think, later around 2016, 2017 for Tokyo. And I ran London and I got into a ballot. Then I ran Berlin late, later that year. And... You know, that was when it was like first come, first serve. So yeah. that's a kind of crazy time. And I had a, a pause between running after that because I was, uh, I think I was just not in the, I was in a different space of, in my life and I was just trying to use running to try to control it. And, you know, running is not something you can control. It's one of those things that really teaches you a lot when you, you step back and like accept it for what it is. And I got to a state of just not liking running after Berlin. I stopped. I was trying to break sub four. Mm. I didn't do it. I think I did it like 404. I stopped running for about four, 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 five years. Okay. And then I saw the London Marathon on the BBC years later. And I was just like, man, this looks incredible. You see all these people, just regular people, just going for it, you know, going for charities close to their heart. And yeah. I thought, okay, go for the ballot again. I was lucky enough to get a place. And then I ran that. And then... I thought, okay, forget that. And I, I'm not going to do any more. I didn't really think about the America one, so I thought that's kind of a little bit out of my reach. And I had a friend who ran New York City Marathon. I said to her, like, what's it like? And she, she's like, I was like, it can't be as good as London, right? She's like, no, it's better. I was mm. like, what? <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. So I want a piece of this. So I was like, okay, I've got to yeah. figure out a way to get there. And she, she was right. Um, I, I think it's obviously subjective to which, which marathon major is your favorite. I mean, London and New York are very, for me, are very close. Yeah. Uh, but New York was the real, the real catalyst that, that sort of started the journey that why not? So that was back in 2016. So there's a massive gap um, before um, I actually then kind of you really wanted to make it a thing. And then I did that one and then it basically was a catalyst for the rest of them. So what um, a couple questions. One is that you mentioned that you felt like um, the American uh, marathons like New York, et cetera, were a little bit out of your reach in terms of like skill or just like planning a whole vacation around doing a marathon or, or with travel or, or like what did you feel? How do you mean that? Not that it was – I think maybe to give some context, I think sometimes you can really limit your own – thinking of what was possible yeah not that it was impossible i just said to myself felt that's not for me like that's for someone else there's no way that right. i can get into those races you know that's for someone else and then you you see someone that you know and you're thinking oh well they've done it and you think well why can i not do it then right. you have that conversation with yourself well why am i limiting myself yes and then i do once you sort of you know decide that you want to do something then it sort of happens and then i decided and i figured out a way to get to new york and then I made that happen. Then once I did that, I was like, then I figured out how to do the rest of them. So it's just like yeah. a mindset thing. Yeah. Once you that. sort of change that mindset, then things happen. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. I, I, uh, I remember, you know, like college age up until I think I did my first triathlon. Well, it would have been about 17 years ago and my son was born about that time. So, um, yeah, like mid thirties. And so, um, I kind of had the same, like I, you know, you'd see the Ironman like weekend special, that type of thing. And so like triathlon and, and, and I, I came from a pretty athletic background, but I looked at marathons and, and triathlons and stuff as like that, like that, those are other people, right? That, that certainly isn't yeah. me. That's, that's not something that I could do. And then you, um, kind of similar type of thing was I went, you know, I did like a turkey trot and looked around at a bunch of the people that were finishing up top and they didn't look all that special. And then I went to a triathlon and boy, I saw the people that were finishing triathlon and I was like, hold, okay, come on, let me, you know, get out of my own way here and get out of my own head and let me go do this. Yeah. Is that a, um, that's go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to ask, you know, I mean, kind of going back to, um, and I want to, I want to spend some good time talking about the, the whole black trail runners initiative, but is that something, because I mean, we're talking about it sort of just as men or just as humans about like, well, I see this level of achievement and think that that's maybe out of my reach because I didn't come from that background. Do you think that, um, you know, as a black man, like, is there just a whole other level of inaccessibility that you see out there when it comes to things like running marathons or running ultras or trail marathons and those types of things? I think for this situation, I've got to be honest, I can only really speak from my experience. I know there's black people that would have a different uh, mindset, but when I grew up, I was told that explicitly at a young age that, you know, the world will see you as slightly different to what you see yourself as, and from then, I think I always grew up with a sort of chip in my shoulder that I wasn't good enough. Mm. And I think then I was always just trying to overcompensate. And that was through school achievements, things like that. So people look at you at a certain age and think, you know, you do really well. You're achieving this. You've got these these things. But for me, it was always never really enough. I was always chasing the next thing, the next thing, and the next thing. And it's just it was like putting, you know, water into a bucket full of holes. You know, mm. it's always going to, you know, empty at some point. So... That's what kind of happened to me when I was doing like the, the initial round of marathons in London and Berlin. That's like another set of achievements. I was like, I must get, you know, sub four. And in London, I, I ran 4.55 and I just completely blew up. Mm. Just did all the rookie mistakes. And then I went back into Berlin and I was like four minutes off. And I remember seeing like the sub four people go past me after like mile 20 and it just literally just broke me uh, um but you know you need those experiences yeah. sometimes and I, I look back at it now and i think you know that really made me but at the time it felt awful like i just didn't think i could come back from it but now it's you know, it definitely made me so it sounds like it's it was sort of part um certainly a big part motivation and maybe a little part handicap those voices you know the 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 words that were said to you as a young kid, um, have you too, one, one is, um, like, have you used them? It sounds like as motivation, but, um, in retrospect, do you think that those were accurate and fair words? Like, are you glad that, that you had that sort of implanted in your brain? Or do you think that that was an unfair assessment of what your life was going to be like? Like, did it put an improper chip on your shoulder? I guess is the question. I think, you know, as a parent, I think when you look back at your parents, you have a lot more grace Yeah. when you have your own kids. But at the time, you just think, oh, I can't believe you said that. Mm. And I think when I look back, I just think, you know, my parents knew what they knew and tried the best for what they could at the time. And, you know, they're passed on their own sort of traumas as well. Like my mum was first generation in the UK um, and her parents were from the Caribbean. So... You know, you're not really fitting in any camp, really. You're not from the Caribbean, but you're not English, so people just yeah. don't see you that way. So I think she was basically trying to hard me up um, and just be like, look, well, because this is what life is going to be like. Yeah. So and I never, it almost sort of took away your childhood, if, if that makes sense. You never really had that chance to kind of feel like settled to a certain extent. So, um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, have any sort of remorse for my mum for, for saying those things, and sure. it was what was needed at the time. But I think, you know, life is about taking responsibility. And then I think, basically, what I've learned recently now, not just now, but obviously before that, is that you know, that th- th- those words aren't mine to carry. You know, that's not my narrative for my life. You know, I am intrinsically a good person. I'm good enough, and I just don't see myself through that that sort of those lens anymore if that makes sense whereas when i did that was a real source of just a lot of anguish Um, especially when you sort of see my um boston marathon (laughs) video and i was just like they asked me how i felt and i just literally broke down in tears because i was just like you sort of think about like the person you've had to become to to get to that stage and but yeah i mean like it's all it's it's only good we look back at it but at the time it was obviously a terrible thing to go through but yeah i i i I see the world in a a different space that makes sense. Well, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I was going to ask that question with regard, you had mentioned something like, you know, I'm a good person, you know, these things. And I was going to ask, like, was there a time when maybe, maybe before you got into running or, or, you know, had children, uh, you know, became a good husband, whatever they were, but like where you felt like you wore those, you wore those words more, um, like you accepted those words. And now that you've, like, is it accomplishment that has distanced you from that vision of yourself or, um, 
or did you know what I mean? Like, did you change or did, did your perception of those words change? I guess is my question. I don't know. I think running has almost saved my life, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think you go into it thinking like it's another thing to achieve. I'm going to run these times. I'm going to achieve these things. But through what's been a constant is that with running, it's, it's uncomfortable. You're going to fail a lot and you're going to have a lot of time to think about the physical and the mental pain. And then, then you've got that time to think about how you respond back to those, those voices. And I mean, seriously, the lessons that running has taught me, I mean, we could speak for hours about it. Yeah. And, um, but you know, I think for me, just like, you know, coming back from that 455 and, you know, eventually breaking sub three, uh, you know, those kind of lessons that, you know, you, you, you know, sort of the person you've gone to, to become to, to, to achieve those things. But it's, mainly been through yeah i guess the the uncomfortable moments the, the the difficulties you know when you're running and it really hurts and you know at the beginning you you think it's just you you're weak you know but then you yeah. realize actually a lot of people have the same you know pain impacts people the same sort of way but it's just like at that time in my life i just didn't have the right words to respond back to it. i was just like oh it's painful okay uh, i must be weak yeah. Whereas now it's just like I have a different conversation with it. I mean, for example, I was doing a, <clears throat> excuse me, I was doing a, a training run a couple of weeks ago, and I was my legs were hurting. I was just like I said to my legs, I was like, "Thank you for making me like more resilient and making me stronger." But that's not a conversation I would have had like uh. you know ten years ago. I'd be like, "Oh my god, I'm so weak. I'm <laughs> terrible. It's, it's, it's me." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter why you feel unworthy. It it is up to you to prove that you are right. It doesn't matter all the, all the therapy or the, you know, whatever other people around you sort of telling you that you're worthy. It, you kind of have to prove yeah. it to yourself at some level. Yeah. And like doing the Boston marathon, I think that was one of the, I think one of the reasons I sort of broke down a little bit because I just realized actually all the things I was looking for, I would had it inside me. I, I really was enough. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is one of the greatest things about running is, <clears throat> and, um, I don't know, it just, it, like running is so, you know, I do a lot of swim. I do a lot of bike. I do a lot of run and, and the bike and the swim, I'd be curious to, to know if you feel this, like there's nothing else that does what running does for me mentally. Um, in terms of clearing my head, I mean, I can be in the worst, darkest places and, running seems to be about the only thing um, that can really clear my mind of those things. Other things can make me better, like feel better in the short term, but running seems to be the only thing that really like cleanses my soul in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, especially in this the world where things are a little bit more comfortable, obviously pre COVID where, you know, you could go out for a nice meal, go for a nice holiday, buy some nice clothes or whatever. It's like, why are people still attracted to do these things that really hurt? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we just kind of, we need a bit more. So I think this is why running and those kind of activities for some people, you know, uh, you know, have an attraction. Well, I think there's definitely a, you know, a, there's an innate sense within us. You know, the, we are so, we've come in a very short amount of time. We have come so far from where we are as as hominids or as humans, you know, sort of fighting for survival, right? And so now yeah. you don't have to fight for a whole heck of a lot. And I think your body still has that um, that inherent – your body hates sitting still. It hates getting sedentary. You know, whether, whether you know, your brain loves it, your body hates it. And so there, there's always that nag in the back there that just says, like, go, go hurt, you know, go – yeah, I love I – mean, Lance is the, the great – saying like it, it never stops hurting. You just get faster, you know, or you run longer, yeah. whatever the, whatever the, um, the, the pain of the day is. Right. And so, um, and that's something that, you know, that it, 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 at certain levels of, of exercise, there's, there's nothing else. There's no drug in my opinion. There's no, uh, person, there's no anything that can take the place of that, of the endorphins and the things that can, that you can feel when you achieve those things in yourself. And to your point of like proving that you've got something inside of yourself that maybe you didn't think you had before. Yeah, exactly. And it's like when it's getting painful, it's like the normal responses, I say normal, but before I was a runner was like to stop and, you know, to, to try to 
avoid it, but as a runner, I mean, I'm not saying you'd be reckless and, you know, run yourself with the ground, but if you're doing a tempo run or an interval session, for example, you know, you're in it and you just like, I think I'm at a different place now where you can actually take a stop, a breath, take a moment and just, you know, talk back to that voice, have a moment to reflect and just be like, yeah, it is painful. It, it yeah. does hurt because I'm actually doing difficult things and I actually can do this because I've done this before. Or even if it feels really difficult, just give my, my best effort and I can just, you know, keep going for another second or I can you know, for going for another five seconds. And yeah, yeah I mean, those sort of conversations uh, definitely change, but yeah, I mean, this is not the lessons I thought I would have learned from running at the start. At the beginning, I thought it was just going to be PRs, medals, <laughs> running off of the sunset. But when you, you do any sort of training, you just realise actually that's very few and far between. Like, you know, most of my runs, you know, it's just you solitary, you know, cold, wet, you know. Yeah. And there's only a couple moments of like, I say, quote unquote, glory. But then you're like, okay, once you've done it, you're just like kind of moving on to the, on to the next one because it's not a place that you like, you can you know that you actually own you know yeah it's like it's rented to it's almost like when you're getting into like uh, race shape it's like i get i always think like that it's almost rented to it's almost loaned to because it's you know you only got that sort of peak fitness for a certain amount of time and then it goes oh, you know exactly. once you've run the race yeah and you, so you feel like you've always got to earn it type thing huh yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I, I've I've not yet done a marathon. I'm sort of in this um, 2021. Whether they have to be virtual or whatever they're going to be, I'm running. Uh, I'm I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to run a 50. And the thing, you know, like coming from you know where you're running 5ks and 10ks, and then even like half marathons is not that a PR is possible every time, but certainly consistency is possible every time. You know, you're not really going to bonk on a 5k or a 10k. You might on a half marathon, but typically, you know, your glycogen stores and things like that will carry you through. Um, you know, an hour and a half, hour and 45 or less, or whatever it is. And so, I haven't had to deal with those massive swings and like you know. You're running a three hour to five hour, depending on how badly you blow up in a race. Um, yeah. So mentally, like you know, you you kind of talked about the time when you were in the hotel in Boston. Like when you started, because you kind of jumped um, in fairly quickly. Um, if I recall, you sort of did your first 10k on a bet or a sort of a challenge from a friend, right? Yeah. And so when you go from like a 10 K and then up to a marathon, how do you start to adjust the mental side of, um, of like, you know, cause you said like, you know, like pushing yourself harder is one thing to push your system harder, but then you're now you're balancing on, you know, stress fractures and other things like, you know, where you're physically damaging your body. How do you approach that, the mental side of running marathons to keep yourself healthy, to keep yourself pushing through pain? Um, like, how do you balance that fine line between uh, normal pain, intense pain, and then injury pain? It's a good question. I think I would have completely handled it differently when I started, but I'll probably try and give you something more relevant to what I do now and maybe something the listeners can take away from. I worked with the um, sports psych, basically, a guy called Duncan Foster. And for a week, I mean, you could do this, it doesn't have to be applicable to running, but he got me to write down my thoughts, healthy and unhealthy, mm. um, during running for a week. And you'd be surprised how many unhealthy thoughts you think and how much we berate ourselves. And I just wasn't aware. It sounds ridiculous, but sometimes subconsciously you're not aware of the abuse that you give to yourself. Mm. And I was coming back thinking, man, this is like disgusting. I mean, you wouldn't say this to anyone else. Like wow. <laughs> the, the stuff that you say when you're really struggling. So it basically made me think about, it just gave me the gift of awareness. So, I mean, I'm obviously talking about just like relative pain in terms of just like for training, not kind of pushing yourself to that, those kind of limits to, to kind of injure yourself. But, I just sort of think, well, I have the, the option of just talking back to myself, you know, just to kind of, you know, you, you've always got an option. That's the way I sort of see it, really. So, and I think that basically after that week, it's allowed me to sort of think about the conversation I was having with myself and how I would speak to myself and, you know, the, the, what I'd say. But, you know, if you're you're running and say it's like 
you know, you're, you're actually feeling sharp pain or something like that, then you know it's time to stop. But then, you know, there's a difference where, for example, um, actually, much, this might be a better example, actually. Um, <laughs> like, for example, like when you're doing like a 10K or a half marathon, you know, like you said, you're probably not going to hit the wall. But when you get to the marathon, it's going to be, you know, a lot more tricky. So something I find I struggle with is this, the nutrition side. And I've practiced my nutrition, you know, my, my long runs and things like that. And I remember uh, when I ran New York um, a couple of years ago, I was starting to feel nauseous and I just stopped taking my gels. Mm-hmm. Then I hit the wall, you know, and, you know, especially when you're hitting the last 10K. I mean, it's almost like suicide. Yeah. And this marathon, I ran my sub three and we had like terrible weather and I started to feel nauseous. And then you could sort of argue, are you going to the point of like, is it, really <laughs> it's beyond this the mental pain it's actual like a physical thing and i was thinking like okay well if i stop taking my gels now i'm gonna hit the wall and i'm just gonna suffer even more so i was just trying to manage you're in that balance of running where you're not going to be sick yeah. but you still need to fuel and it was, it was so uncomfortable for that was like for 14 plus mile from mile 14 onwards wow. i was managing it it wasn't like this sort of fairy tale procession i was like running you know, like sub three pace and i was enjoying life yeah. <laughs> i was really i was really suffering but yeah i think at that level you kind of know like sometimes you, you sort of basically you're, you're pushing your limits you're pushing your limits because i've been to a place before where i've been in a marathon i've been sick so i was like okay i know it's like you know you don't want to go there but you like you know what that limit is and like once you're once you're sick it's over yeah but when, i'm not sort of advocating like you know if, if my leg was like if I pulled a hamstring or, you know, I, you know, I felt a sharp pain that I'd, I'd, I'd advocate anyone to go. These are more like things I felt like I could manage. Yeah. But I guess like <laughs> as a runner, sometimes your, your perception of like levels does kind of push. So sometimes you, you're not, probably not always, you know, the, the kindest to yourself and, you know, the, the fairest type thing. So, but I would say, you know, with those, with the recent race and the lessons I've learned is that like, I was, it's like an ongoing conversation with myself basically. And like, I was just trying to stay within my limits, but not push too much, but st- yeah. not ease off enough where I was just like, I'm, I'm out. I'm, this is over. Well, it's crazy because you, you know, if you look at like the, you know, the end of 2018 to, um, you know, like two years later, basically you just did the, um, you did the London virtual marathon, but you did it at an actual race, the Dorney Lake marathon. Um, yeah. and you went sub three. So you, you basically cut 26 minutes ish off of your marathon time in less than 24 months. And so you're going you know, to basically do the math. You're a minute faster on your pace on a marathon and yeah. you, so you're out there on a day, you're running faster than you've ever run before. You're not feeling comfortable. So like you're describing you're halfway through the race and you're already in distress. And so what are you doing in your brain that is like, um, you know, again, it's not like, Hey, you know, just keep this going for one more mile. Like you're halfway through a marathon and you're already feeling distress. What, like, what are, I'm, 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 we're looking for tools here, right? So we're, we're picking your brain. How did, you know, how do you keep yourself one foot, next foot, next foot, keep yourself moving forward? I think it's been like a progress from like all the marathons before. Like I'll start off by saying, when I ran London the first time, I did 4.55. And I remember seeing my wife and just thinking, like, I've, I'm done. I don't want to run anymore. Like, I've hit the wall. Yeah. And that was, I felt so weak. And she was like, no, you've got to keep going. So it's been like, a, it's been an evolution. So it's not been like, I went to one marathon and I, and I was like, the Terminator. And I just went, <laughs> and I, yeah. and I went for it. It's been like failing and then learning and you get up you fail you go again you fail you go again so last year i i, I well the year before I, I tried to run sub three three times and i just missed it around three or five fear one and three nineteen at new york so yeah. i had those in my head and i was just like i got to uh dawny this year and the weather was terrible so i was just like man this is like <laughs> it's crazy so that was really in my head just thinking about the weather right and so I'm running and I'm feeling comfortable. But and so to answer your question, what gave me confidence initially was that the weeks before I was doing a lot of marathon pace tempo runs, like 80 mile runs. Yeah. And I was hitting the paces comfortably. I was like, you know, I, I went into the race almost not arrogant, but I, I, I believed and I was just really more relaxed than yeah. I'd been before. I, I went in there believing it was going to happen. 
But then, you know, like I said, when things started to go sl- slightly south, um, you know, I was always aware that, like, in a marathon, like, the marathon owes you nothing. Like, there's not been one marathon where it's all been perfect and, you know, it's been pr- plain sailing. Like, I always knew there was going to be one point that was going to test me. There's always a point in a marathon where it goes, how much do you really want this? Yeah. And that was my point. I was just like, I'm feeling sick. So your head's going, slow down. You know, you could walk off this course. You know, no one will care. You know, no one will, <laughs> only you will know. You yeah. can pretend it didn't happen. You know, all those sort of, those, those dark thoughts go through your head and you're just like, no. And I was like, no, I've, I've worked too hard for this. Yeah. You know, like, for example, I remember when I ran New York City Marathon and I got 319 and I spoke to my wife, I was just like, in tears afterwards i got a pr but i was i was so devastated devastated because the time that you spend training i mean it's not my full-time job but you know the effort that you put in it was just like that was devastating because it was a like time away for my kids yeah and also my son was born this year and i was just thinking about all the time i've not you know i've had to do long runs and i've been tired and not been able to help out my wife has basically shouldered some responsibility to allow me to do what i'm doing so i was thinking like there's no way you can quit. Like people, not just you, but people have invested for you to be here. Like and for you to sort of say you're going to quit because it's it's raining. That you just not. So I just really the voices came in. I just had to turn it around. I just really bullied myself. I was like, there's no way you're going to quit. You're just going to give your best effort. And I was just like, do not look at your watch. You know what it feels like to run this pace. Just run by effort and just manage it. Just manage it. Um, and it's just basically just that conversation with yeah. yourself. And I think once you tell yourself that, your 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 brain kind of gets out of its own way and goes like, okay, this guy's not messing around. This woman's not messing around. Just we just need to do it. So my thing is that you don't deny that it's uncomfortable and it's painful, but you just give yourself a little breather and be like, okay, what is the best thing that I could do now? What is the best next step? So for me, like trying to be sick was not trying to be sick was just like, look, okay slow the pace down but just keep going enough that you're not going to be sick but enough that you're not going to drop off the pace too much yeah and there's your gels just take your gels but really just sip them just take a little bit do you know what I mean just extend it a little bit more so those were basically my answers at yeah, the man. time so basically speak back to those doubts and just try and figure out it's like being a detective you yeah. know on the run basically you're just trying to figure things out yeah it's it's um the have you ever done improv at all any kind of improv yeah so there's a thing in improv called yes and and the idea in improv is like i'm gonna throw out you know like oh you're a you know you're an italian um chef at a uh all boys school and you say yes and (laughs) i am a blah blah you know so that was a horrible example but you get the idea is that you never answer no right it's always a yes and and so um one of the things that i've tried to do when I'm, when I'm racing or when I'm training is that, you know, when your legs are screaming at you, it's not to say shut up legs or no, you don't hurt. It's yes. And it's, you know, yes. And, you know, my heart is stronger than my legs or my, you know, whatever it is, but you try to throw that, like acknowledge the pain and the suffering, but then throw the, the sort of good thought on top of that. Yeah. And I think sometimes people can think like, it's almost going to be this thing that's unexpected, but it's like, it's ridiculous. It's like, it's just part of running. And I think before it was something I tried to avoid like the plague, but yeah. actually you have to kind of make it your friend, the discomfort. And yeah. that's where the progress comes from. I mean, before when I was trying to avoid it and, you know, when you try to avoid it or try to pretend it's not there, that's when it gets worse. That's when it gets a lot darker and, you know, it costs compounds. And I've, and I've been in that place before. And it's just like, I know where it goes and I'm not going to go there. I'm going to acknowledge you for what you are, but just know this, you're not going to beat me. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, the three hour thing is such an arbitrary, um, it's a great marker. It's a great badge of honor, but it's wholly 100% arbitrary, right? It's a collection of seconds that equals a round number, but you've been remarkably consistent over the last two years. You know, again, you ran the, um, the greater Manchester, you ran a three Oh five 58 at the start of 2019. And then you ran the three Oh one Oh seven. And then the three hours, 19 seconds at New York. I'm curious to know a couple things. One is what does it feel like to just know you crossed that finish line and to know all I had to do was run less than a second faster on my pace for this marathon right? <laughs> 19 seconds spread out over 26. Like, was that, 
Was it a um, elation that you were that close to three hours, or was it devastating that you just couldn't find that extra nineteen seconds? Uh, I I was devastated at the time because I didn't hit hit the target. But when I looked back at it, I just I, you know after I spoke to my wife, I just said to myself, "Did I give my, the best I could?" Yeah, and then that was fine. So I didn't really look back at it and think, "Oh, I could have done this, or could have done that." at that time but then you do the debrief afterwards i think when you're a little bit less emotional yep i think I just, at the time i just needed to be like kind to myself and be like okay cool let's put it in the box and come back to it when you're kind yeah. of in a better place but when i look back at new york i think you know you know I, I ran too quick at the start and you know i was a mile 20 i was at, you know i think it was 215 so i was like 45 minutes i could do 10k yeah <laughs> yeah and that was the point where I was obviously starting to feel sick and I was not fueling and then it just the hills get you yeah so I mean there's no point I think in life looking back and going coulda woulda shoulda right. it didn't happen so I kind of accept it for what it was and at the time I think I just tried the best that I could and it was the, a then PR from you know from Berlin yeah. you know not so long before so I think you know I learned my lessons f- from that race I think Berlin I was really conservative uh, New York. I wouldn't say I was gung ho, but I was I was trying too hard, and you know, in New York is a, is a tough course. I love the course, but it, it's a course you've got respect, and it's a course I want to go back to because I think you just, it's, it's it takes a lot of management to get it just right, really, mm. um, because you're never really running a consistent pace uh, throughout. So you know, just to kind of really manage your legs and run, manage your mind. So yeah. I mean, I look back at it now, I think you know, I I, can't, I have no regrets. I mean, I I gave my best. And I and I learned the lessons from that race, which I took into um, to Dorney really, just to really understand race management. So for Dorney, it was a bit different. Like when I, you know, just really planned like how the, the miles were going to go. Like for you know the first few miles, you know, really settle into it. You know, run slightly slower than your target pace, and then get into your pace. And obviously, you know, for ten plus miles, I was I was cruising. I was feeling really good. Um, but then you know challenges happen and then you just got to make the best of it really yeah. you know but i on the day i was i could manage the challenge better at dorney than i could at in new york i in new york I, I you know i stopped taking my fuels and you know when i should have carried on you know who i, I could have broken it then but if anything <laughs> breaking three at dorney has been, been more satisfying because you've got to bear in mind like you know it's an official race but you know you're running in very small like groups you know you're all spread apart so most of you're running solo there's no crowd support and the yeah. weather is terrible yeah and to come back from that and think do you know what i ran my best in terrible weather with no support what can i do when races come back to you know you know there's crowds and things like that so right. um I, you know i i could take a lot of satisfaction that i broke free uh in only rather than new york so you're you're jumping down from like the three twenty eight down to three oh five is is pretty remarkable. Did you um in the um when you're training and when you're setting a goal pace, was three like <clears throat> was the was how do I say this? Was just three hours the target and that's what you ran toward um whether you succeeded or failed. I'm kind of trying to dig into on the training side how you approach training. So like when you're doing your tempos, when you're doing your intervals, when you're doing your long days, or is the three hour number in your brain or did you just sort of happen to get that fast, if that makes sense? It's a good question because I think at the start when I ran Manchester, it was the sub three. I think it was like the arbitrary goal that everyone else goes for that you feel like you need to do to achieve. And then between Berlin and New York, it almost became a bit of a prison because a person because I it was almost quite limiting because that's all you felt you were thinking about right and um, funny enough when I was going for Dorney actually the more relaxed I became, about it I became the easier so I didn't really think my coach and I we just didn't really have it as, as how can I say this it wasn't the main focus because I think sometimes like on one hand you have to have all but then you need to be relaxed about how you go for it. So what we tried to do was just uh, to see how good I could be. We knew that sub three was possible. So we're just like, just don't talk about sub three. We know you can go under under that. So we're going to try and see how good you can be. Yeah. And the tempo runs, you know, we did enough of those. And then you basically work out, you know, say five weeks out, 
where you are, you know, you know, the the paces that you should be, you know, probably actually less than five weeks, but about four weeks or four, four to five weeks, I'd say. You kind of generally know based on the runs that you've done where you are. Um, and that was basically taking off the sub three shackles and just being like, what can I do? And you, you're yeah. trying to push bases to what's like fast, but like, and what's comfortable to maintain. And, you know, I had that conversation with my coach and we, uh, you know, decided on, on, a, on a certain pace and, you know, we, that's what we, we stuck to, stuck to. And, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things really, but like, yeah, I, I think for Dorney, I think it was more so about not letting the sub three goal yeah. become a prison. And I think when you're running also, you know, running, you know, you're training most days, six, seven days a week, you know, you need, uh, you need focus and the motivation and sometimes, and I think sometimes, that goal can be quite limited. Like I said before, it just stops you from being your best. And sometimes you just need to be like, look, yeah. how good can I be? And just like, just, just work towards that instead of being like, I'm going to run 250. Yeah. I mean, you smashed it. I mean, that, that's what kind of why I asked the question is you were, you were sort of flirting with three hour or three hours. And then you, you know, you did the, again, the three hours, 19 seconds at New York, and then you come back and run a two fifty six nineteen. So it wasn't like a, it's not like you ran two fifty nine forty. you know? Yeah. So on a day like that, when you are um, running, what was, what was your goal on that day, do you remember? Like, did you have a specific goal time in mind that you were running at a pace, or yeah, were you so sort of I like, "How do it. I feel in the moment"? No, it was. It was all. I think you've, you've got to plan these things. You can't. <laughs> you can't really wing it. I've tried that in the past, and yeah. it doesn't work. So, um, going back to what I said before, my coach and I would work down to paces. So we got to a pace, a place where we thought, okay, between six thirty minute per mile average, there's, there's a comfortable place you can go at, and we just go for that. Uh, you know, you set the first mile, 640, you know, first two, three miles, and then okay. you settle into it. Then, you know, ease into your pace. And then once you've got a little bit more, you can pick up. So okay. it's never really just trying to blow up. You know, you basically want to get to mile 20 and feel comfortable and then be able to pick up the pace. You don't okay. want to get to mile 20 and feel terrible and be like, my gosh. Yeah. So um, I, I, that was the plan to run, basically run 630 pace and, you know, okay. get to low 250. But, um, yeah, I've been... Yeah that was and, and when I was getting obviously the weather was getting really bad and things were happening I was just like look I know I can run these paces so that was kind of my back of my mind I was like I know I can do this yeah. but you're never running it thinking like oh, I'm, I'm over this I'm yeah. guaranteed it Yeah, you know, you, you're still <laughs> pushing it until like the finish line you're not like celebrating at mile 25 thinking I could just walk this you're right. just like no keep pushing until you get to the end yeah yeah that so you're you you pretty much stick within about ten seconds or so of a pace that your that your target is, and then yeah. if you feel great at mile twenty or twenty two or whatever, I mean it's when do you know sort of when you're past the wall um, and you're feeling good enough to just sort of leave it all on the course? Would you say is that like tw- twenty four twenty five? Is it twenty twenty two? It just depends on the day and how you feel. Course, I mean, Dawn is quite a flat course, so it, it, it'd be easy to say that the last 10k you could go for it for there, whereas New York would be slightly different. Um, so yeah, the plan was to go for it for then, but you know, in retrospect, you know, something I look back at now, I think it's something I'm implementing now is that like GPS obviously adds a little bit more, and I think something I'm more mindful of now is I think if you're training, you will probably want to be like two or three seconds faster. That your target pace because you've got to bear in mind like when I completed the course I ran average six forty two but I ran well you know my my watch two twenty six point three yeah whatever but you know the courses are right so I'm not disputing the course but generally you're always going to run slightly long and the courses will be slightly long anyway so you've always got to be, aim for more so in my sort of uh, debrief after that's something I'm a bit more mindful of you know if you can't just run six thirty pace you've got to run six twenty eight or something yeah. like that so. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's just course dependent, really. So let's talk about this last um, kind of year and a half, two years, where you go, you basically shave a minute off your pace. So you're running mid seven minute pace to down to mid six minute pace. First off, going back to the you know the guy who uh, you know blew up at London and you know five hours. Yeah, ask him like 
or tell him, like, what would he have told you had you said, hey, stick with this. We're going to be running 630 miles for 26 miles. What would he have told you? He would have laughed. <laughs> Said, get the hell out of here i'm trying to use words that don't involve any swearing so yeah. i'm trying to keep it clean yeah that's pretty remarkable i mean that 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 really is a you know 630 pace for 26 mile like you're you know you're kind of um you've you've smashed the middle of the pack right now you're starting to get up into some rarefied air outside of you know the the yeah. true elites right you're a very yeah. very accomplished age grouper at that point um what did, what did, like describe your training over the last year and a half obviously you had you know several years of really good base put in and so i don't want to discount that but did something happen in your focus in your training in your uh, you know uh physical workouts, mental workouts, like what changed in the last year and a half to shave that much time off? Give us some hope, Marcus. <laughs> yeah, I think before I talk about myself, you, you've got to talk about other people. I'm like, I'm, I don't think I'm at my, my potential, but I think I wouldn't have got to where I am now without the help of other people. Like, my, I wouldn't be able to run and do the training I, I do if my wife didn't support me because I've got two kids. You know, uh, you know, especially the Sunday long run. So she supports me, like I said before. And but to answer your question as well, my coach has been really helpful. When I when I first started running, I was just doing it by myself and just trying to go by, you know, uh, you know, training blocks. You know, sixteen weeks and think, okay, do sixteen weeks, do nothing, and then you know, train again. You know, have some time off, come back to it, and go. Why am I not getting any better? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I remember working with my coach, and I've been with him for like three to four years now. So. When we first started working together, it was just like, look, just give me, you know, three or four years and to see what would happen. I was like, okay, cool. And I think I'm sort of like, you know, really sort of shortening the conversation. But within that conversation, he basically explained to me that like to be, to get to your potential, you need to invest a lot of time. And it's not going to be like one training, but you might do two years and it might progress but trust me, if in the third year you'll, you know, you'll start kicking on. Wow. So when I've been training, I've just been, I was been thinking about that long term approach, not really thinking about, oh, this runs rubbish or, you know, I didn't get the result in this marathon like I did before. But like, okay, cool. Well, I know that my legs are gonna bank this and it's gonna pay off in the future. So I was I had this like not blind optimism, but just a belief that it was gonna happen in the future. So I think just the consistency more than anything else and just understanding how to train. So my coach has been getting me to do it for just a number of years, you know week in week out i mean even like this year um slightly less miles than i would have run last year but i've just run over three thousand miles which when you work out is just over eight point something miles a day yeah you think during like this year or eight that is so with like a newborn and you know work and all that kind of and still time off so that's what's like that's been the basic thing for me. I mean, like some people run more, some people run less, but for me, it's just been the consistency yeah. uh, and just just looking at the long-term view. So like when a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, my races are cancelled. What am I going to do? I was always like, nothing has really changed. Like yeah. <laughs> I'm still going to, the time's going to go, but I'm still going to train for it anyway. So like, I mean, like, I might not be able to do the marathon like this year, but I know my legs are going to bank it for next year. Yeah. So you're running about 55 to 65 miles per week. It sounds like averaging about 60 miles a week. Yeah. Yeah. And then what are, do, are you, do you, do you train heart rate? Do you train pace? Like how do you, how do you approach, how does your coach have you approaching your training? Uh, a little bit of both really. I, my, my coach kind of he gives you the, the basics, but I think he, he reigns you back if he knows you're going you know, you're, you're pushing your limits. And I, I think for me, we've had the conversation, I've basically worked at what easy pace is for me. Now, you can do the whole, you know, get up in the morning and, you know, work at your heart rate because obviously it will change based on, like, stress and life pressure and things like that. And you can be like, okay, I want to run at a certain heart rate and, you know, you stick to that, which is fine. But I tend to just um, go by feel because I feel... Technology is really good, but you know, like I said, like technology can be a handbrake. Like I said to you at the race, at Dorney, like towards the end, I had to trust myself. I had to literally stop looking at my watch. Yeah, and I think sometimes I think people can get so much into like, oh, my heart rate needs to be 
minus 150 or whatever. But then even that can be a lie because, like, for example, you could, st- like, when I ran my first bar in Dorney, it was like 640 pace. I was still like, it was like 100 and under 120 beats mm. per minute. Do you know what I mean? But, like, that doesn't mean, even though it's an easy heart rate, it doesn't mean it's an easy pace to maintain. Right. So I don't always trust heart rate, if that makes sense. I, I, I give it, like, it's one of the, the barriers, one of the, I guess, one of the, um, the rules I, I use, but I, I really try and go by feel. I really just try and slow it down. I, I feel, it should almost feel like it should feel so easy, like you're, you're really restricting yourself, you're, like you're really holding back. Um, mm. And that's the way I try and look at it. I mean, like, an easy pace run could be, like, six-minute miles, seven-minute miles, whatever, but, like, a really easy run should be like nine, you know, eight, yeah. eight nines. And that's why I try and keep it in. And I just write, really try and slow it down. Um, but sometimes you don't always get it right. I mean, like sometimes your ego gets the better of you. I remember I was doing a, a tempo run a couple of weeks ago. And then I was supposed to do it in, in an easy warm down run. And I, I, was, I ended up seeing these guys and they were running in the park and they all ended up pacing this guy to a sub three. But I didn't realize they were pacing to a sub three because I was running with them. It felt easy. Huh. And I don't sound, sound arrogant saying that because they're running at 650 pace, which isn't an easy pace. But it's not until I realized I wasn't looking at my watch yeah. that I was like, I'm going too quick. But it felt <laughs> easy. So that, that's, yeah. that's the thing that, like, how it can mess up with your head sometimes. So I, I really just try and slow it down. Yeah. So on the on your 60 miles, how are they broken up? Like you've got, um, uh, are you running six days a week, you said? Six or seven? It depends. So sometimes it's it's seven days a week, and and then some day, day some weeks it's six days a week. Okay. To give you some rest day, and yeah, so I would doing a long day. It's, it's two mainly long days. Yeah, so it depends really. So it depends what you need. So sometimes it can be three sessions if you're trying to like, you know, you know, add more speed to what you're trying to do. But most of the times it's, it's just two sessions. But obviously then. It will, it will depend on what you need at the time. But for, for me, in the build-up to Dorney, it was mainly two sessions a week okay. and the rest were easy runs with a day off uh, and sometimes an, an easy day. Mm-hmm. But those runs are really are there to facilitate you to do the sessions. And that's, that's what sometimes people forget. It's like, don't be a hero on your easy days. Like, yeah. Just <laughs> literally run it slow, run it easy. I mean, you don't want to be running it too slow where you're out there for like four hours, but yeah. <laughs> at the same time, you want to be like respecting your body. So you're like, okay, where does the session, each one has to have a purpose. You know, yeah. you have to understand the, the point of each run. So, yeah. So as you, um, as you look back, uh, are you still working with a coach? I would assume. Yeah. Still my coach, John, um, we've been together for like, it sounds like a marriage when I say that. <laughs> for over four and a bit years so you know we got really well and uh yeah he's uh been a massive help and you know we we speak you know weekly i speak to him or i connect or send him a text or whatever or he sees like the results for my my sessions and we we have that sort of conversation you know it's like real-time feedback so yeah. that, that's i mean yeah i don't think i would have you know like obviously like i said mentioned my wife as well but i wouldn't be doing what i'm doing without my coach yeah, I mean, it certainly it takes a great support network. I, I applaud you, and I'm I'm um, I'm very envious and inspired by. I think if a coach came to me and said, "Hey, stick with me the next three or four years, and I'll get where you, get you where you have to go," like I would be like, "You're crazy." I'm not, you know, I can't yeah. commit to you know a month, much less four years. But it's um, it's really inspiring to hear you say that because I you know I, I have definitely seen a total plateauing in my athletic career. And, you know, it's like, you'll have a great year and you start to sort of move toward certain times and things like that. And then you just sort of stall out. And some of it I attributed to age and some of it I attributed to just working too much or whatever it is. But the, um, it's kind of like that whole idea of like who would ever run a hundred miles, right? It's like looking at what you've done and saying, well, yeah, I mean, maybe the commitment that you have to make is working with a coach, taking this really serious, not for a year, but for, and not for two, but, you know, for three, four, five years um, in order to start to reach the, t- the type of human potential that, um, that you have within you. So, um, but he gave me a lot of little milestones within it. This is to say, like, by this time, you'll probably get here. Yeah. Get here. So basically, everything that he said, or more or less most, most of the things that he said have happened about running yeah. sub three or at certain times. So, it's like it, it's proven himself right. Yeah. So 
um, obviously it's difficult to believe at the start when you're just like, he must say it's everyone, but it's, it's nice to me that he's actually right. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're, you're, you know, you're breaking off a mortgage, you know, it's like four years, man. <laughs> like, exactly, yeah. What are you talking about? But no, but it's, you know, um, you know, when I, you know, I think about, you know, I wrestled in high school or whatever, you know, there's four years right there. And yeah, I mean, my first year I was awful and then you get better and better and better. And, you know, it's like anything else. It's, it takes you, it takes you like, I guess, you know, I wouldn't look at my career and say, well, wait a second. Like I'm, if I can't learn to write great software within a year, I don't even want to try. I mean, I didn't even think about it in those, like I, you know, I said, well, okay, the next 20, 30, 40 years, I'm going to be doing this. And so I want to get amazing at it. Right. And so you, you yeah. take those things on and you take the training on and you take the mentorship and coaching. And, but it's, it's funny that I, I guess I just have completely lost that mindset. So you are my new inspiration. Um, again, like I, I just talked to, um, Jamil Corey, who's a, you know, very accomplished, uh, uh, ultra runner here in, in the States owns a great company, Air Vipa in Arizona. And, um, he kind of inspired me to just finally put a stake in the ground and sign up for a 50 miler this summer. So I've done that. And now I think you're my inspiration to just put a stake in the ground and go get myself a coach and start taking this thing seriously. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes you don't always need a coach, but for me, like it's been really helpful and I've yeah. learned so much from, from the, like, I'm the sort of person before, like I wonder if you myself, yeah. But sometimes in life, actually, to get further, you need to work with other people. Yeah, I think I know myself well enough. I can, I can, I'm, um, I'm like an, uh, an uber optimist. And so I'm not a good, yeah. like, I need somebody to sort of smack me around a little bit from time to time, you know, and not that, you know, I mean, I know coaches do, you know, <laughs> they don't just smack you around, but I think my, my, uh, uh, I'm too easy on myself when things go wrong and, you know, it's like, oh, I'll get it next time type of thing. And I think I need, I definitely need a coach because I, I, I have had one for brief periods of time and I saw massive gains when I did have a coach. So, yeah, I mean, but I just didn't stick with it. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's what you give from it as well. Like sometimes, like, I think sometimes people can go into coaching relationships with unrealistic expectations. It's like, it's a two way conversation and you, know, you have to do not obviously everything they say, but sometimes you can, you can kind of suggest things later, but you know, you need to kind of respect the process. And like, I mean, this time when I was starting out with him, I didn't respect the process and I was doing, like for example, I was doing double runs and I thought, Oh, I'll be clever. And I'll just do both as a single run. Yeah. It's just like, what, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> so uh-huh. Explain the reason why you can do it. And it's like, the reason why it works so well is not because I just follow everything he says, but I think because I respect him you know I mean? in terms of just do any, he sees that I'm committed yeah. and I don't follow it. He sees I'm giving my best. Whereas if you're kind of not really doing certain things, then your coach will probably, if you're a good, good coach, will be like, look, we're not, I'm trying to do everything. It's not working. You can have that conversation. So I think it's a, a two way conversation rather than someone going like, here's the answers. Go forth, my child and run. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's kind of a, bit, a bit of both. Yeah, I think I think anytime you have somebody who believes in you and can take you through, um, you know, it's almost like a translator in your brain. Like, you know, take those, you know, on the good days, maybe you don't need somebody there, but on the bad day, days, especially, you know, kind of someone to lift you back up into that good space and to tell you that it's okay to have a bad day and here's what you can gain from the bad day and start to giving you those tools is, uh, um, yeah, I mean. Any way you could go two fifty six nineteen if you didn't have that coach for the last four years? I th- I think that's, that's a hard question to answer. Really, I think the great thing that working my coach is he's given me belief, and he's just shortcutted the route. So I don't want to. I mean, I think I would have maybe got sub three through brute force, but yeah. it would have taken me a lot longer. Uh, sometimes you need to work with someone that just knows what they're doing to help you kind of avoid the, the pitfalls that you would have taken yourself. But like I said, like what I, I, I couldn't, you know, what, can't, what you can't buy is like sometimes having the belief of someone else that someone else has in you. I mean, that's amazing. Like for example, like when I'm doing training runs, I think, oh man, this is going to be really tough. I think, well, John thinks I can do it. Yeah. So why don't I just give myself a chance and just give myself a best shot and just see what happens. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Like, 
having that person in you is, is a you know supporting you is amazing and that could just be like a teacher parent whatever yeah so i'm just glad that i have that relationship with my coach what is you what have you gotten out of the podcast that um um you know the the people you've talked to uh since starting it um have you and again it's the the runners runners life podcast so yep, yeah so look for that on itunes spotify wherever you download your your podcasts um i i've listened to again i listened to a few episodes over the break they were great what have you gotten from talking to i know what i've gotten a ton in just 20 whatever quick episodes that we've done here over the last few weeks um what have your takeaways been as you've talked to other people from from the running space it's changed. So I think at the beginning, you're just trying to ask questions and not really listen to what they're saying. And you're trying to get the information out. And it's like they could say something really <laughs> amazing and you just miss it. And it's like, oh, <laughs> next yeah. question. So I think it's, it's more so I'm asking questions that I really want to know the answers to myself. Yeah. In terms of like what we're thinking about as runners and how we deal with adversity and challenges and what is it all really about? What's it all for? And and how you, t- you know, you kind of mix those lessons into life. Like I had people I've spoken to, like we live in different parts of the world, but when you speak to these people, just like we are pretty much identical in the way we think about running and how we approach these certain things. And it's amazing to connect with those people um, that you would have normally been able to meet because it's outside of your circle or yeah. your, the area that you live in. So I think for me, it's been the way that I speak is, you know, in terms of just like asking questions has been different. I'm, just, I'm trying to find it a little bit more, but I think essentially the questions have been, been the same. I mean, the same, same goal really. It's just to, I'm really just trying to find out like what makes people tick. Yeah. And I'm basically asking, like I said, I'm repeating myself, but I'm asking questions that I really want to know myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have found that I, I've, I've spoken again, like a guy like Jamil or, or, um, Nick Simmons, who was an Olympian, Anthony Famoletti, Olympian, you know, like some, um, one of the beautiful things and the mind numbingly frustrating things about the human condition and our abilities is kind of what you just said. Like what works for you not, won't necessarily work for me. You have different pain tolerances and thresholds. You have different mental triggers. You have different things. And it's great hearing a lot of, you know, what people can, can push through. But Jamil was, uh, relaying a story. I think it was in Western States where he was like 30 miles in and was just in severe distress, um, some GI issues and some other things. And so, you know, he's like, well, if I just lay down for a little while, like I can still, you know, finish it. And he laid down for a few hours and then basically got up and just like glided the next 65 miles. <laughs> you know, it was like, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? You know, like, I <laughs> Like, oh, so you're just saying I need a nap? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm missing in my life. But it's yeah, that's amazing, that's yeah. you know. But it's great, you know. And and again, it's like you know, it, you know, we all we all focus on the two fifty six nineteen at Dorney, but we we tend to forget the 10 years before that, you know, leading, you know, so you go from the 455 down to the 256 and there's 10 years of effort in there, 10 years of learning your body and learning how to train and race and all of those things. And that's what um, I've just absolutely loved talking to the people on, on, on the athletes podcast is just like yourself, like, you know, I mean, had I talked to you two years ago, you know, I'm talking to a guy who's who's desperately trying to break 330, right? And then now I'm talking to a guy who's flirting, you know, with 245. And all of a sudden, again, in, you know, super rarefied air in there. So um, it's just cool watching the, the journeys that people have gone through to get where they are. Oh, thank you. It's funny as you talk, talking back to your example of like the, your guests and the lessons that they they teach you. It's like what am I going to do with that? And I remember speaking to one guest, and I think one of the questions I had at the start of the year was just like, "What are you thinking about when it's get, when things get really hard?" And one particular guest was just like, "You know, I'm just in the moment. I'm just not really thinking." I was just a bit like, "I was like, but surely you must be thinking about this. <laughs> like, yeah. like there must be something." Right. Right. <laughs> and I was just like. Until I was just like I was running, I was like, oh, I, I get it now. Like seriously, like to, he, he, not that he didn't care about it. It was just like he did the work, and it was just 
it just led to a level of relaxation that he could just yeah. do what he needed to do. Yeah. I didn't really get it until later on. I was just like, I must be doing this process and this process. Sometimes like with running, it's like you really have to like let go of your own sort of expectations and yeah. you know, it should be this or it shouldn't be that and just just be in the moment. Yeah. And it's quite hard at the start to kind of allow that to happen. Like like yeah, I've had conversations with people and they basically sort of show me that and another stuff like where people are just like just simply break things down into like <laughs> something you've just overcomplicated. And I would thought you just like you just hear it, just like it's really not that deep. You just need to kind of just yeah. do it that way. Well, it's important to talk to people because you never know when you're going to hear those um, those little nuggets of how somebody deals with the mental game or whatever. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was in triathlon, coming off the bike. It feels like after you've been on a trampoline, like you can't you can't tell how fast or slow you're running. Your legs are just somewhere else. You know, they just like your whole perception of how you're running and and how think you know you're used to things passing you at 25 miles per hour from the bike. And so when you're running, it feels like you're running very, very slowly. And um, I just got this advice of like train to a pace, you know, whatever it is, and then use your Garmin, you know, your GPS to just tell you for that first mile off the bike, like just look at your watch and just that, trust the watch. You're going to feel awful. You're going to feel like you want to quit, but just trust the pace. And, uh, and sure enough, like every single time at about three quarters of a mile, my legs would finally loosen up and it's like, okay, good. But the old me, you know, would have just been like, oh man, slow it down, stretch, you know, like, holy cow, what's going on with my legs. And so I think the, um, the one thing that I've definitely learned absolutely in this podcast, but over the years is, is like, talk to as many people, get, get those different perspectives. They won't all match your own and you can't necessarily implement everybody's plans, but Finding those little nuggets are really, are uh, man, they they are like gold. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, because like I said we're always learning, aren't we? We don't know everything, so like you're saying, learning from other people is so important. Yeah, absolutely. What has um, your involvement, um, your founding of the, of the Black Trail Runners, um, sort of on that same subject? Um, uh, like how have you leveraged some of the conversations and the, you know, just the time spent with, um, with all of the, the folks that you've got running that organization, working toward a common goal. Um, has it changed your perception of how you run or is it more on the organizational side of things? It's been such a heavy year really for so many people. And it's, um, one of the things I've got involved with and obviously, you know, it involves a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I think it's a good thing because, you know, we are basically asking a question that let's make running a normal place for people who don't look like the majority to be seen in places outside of the cities and well, they're not, and you know, people beforehand would be like, "No, it's not." But the the stats kind of prove it that, yeah. especially in the UK, that there's like less than one percent of uh, BIPOC people that visit like UK parks and things like that. And you know, you are seen as an oddity, and people get confused and think, "Oh, well, that means like you can't go to places." It's like you can go to places, and you know, it's just the perception of how you feel. So, for example, it's like me saying when I did the World Marathon Majors, you could say to someone, "Oh, you could like had the conversation about the New York." conversations like well let's go get, get on a plane and figure it out but at the time it was just like there's no way I could do this so I mean there's some people that kind of a bit like think like that and you can't just sort of you know diminish other people's uh, experiences so they all think well this is where I, I can run this is where I can't run and we're just trying to be like look this is a place for everyone to run so yeah. we're just trying to create initiatives um, uh, through you know skills representation and learning uh, to allow people to get the experience and feel comfortable to you know to to run outside of like you know urban areas and we're working with other brands as well it's not just about kind of being like I don't, some people think it's like some sort of black separatist group it's not <laughs> it, the whole point is to try is try to integrate it so we can actually right. look at it and be like oh that normal part of running like I would love it in like say ten years or whatever, and time my kid or so the time my kids are older and they if they choose to run or not, they're like we're, we're all like running and no one's really thinking about that race aspect. Yeah, you know, and and you know, black Toronto doesn't have to exist. That would be my ideal. Yeah, um, I it, was, it's not that people 
sorry, I, yeah, I was I was looking at the website and things. And frankly, you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago um, when we first chatted. Was I wonder how much of that is you know is perception, and then obviously perception is reality, and it can be a very powerful positive or negative what your perception of things is. But then when I was reading the website and I came across your 21 in 21 initiative and I was kind of startled, frankly, was I think you guys analyzed like 800 upcoming registrations in trail running events over in the UK. And I think you found like eight athletes, I think eight registrations um, for people of color or, you know, whatever um, the, the term that, you, you know, that was like, that's crazy. Like that was start because I, I was it, my first reaction to twenty one and twenty one is like well that's a super modest goal like that's that's kind of like that's way too low what do you, you got to be there and then but it was eight yeah. or something like that out of eight hundred which was crazy yeah the first thing that we did was we approached like different um, race organizations and to get the data and a lot of them didn't have the data and when we got the data you know the numbers are really low so. I think for us, it's kind of like it could be twenty one and twenty one in terms of uh, one event, but it's just the whole overarching idea is just to increase representation, whether that's in you know virtual workshops or actual you know running groups or yeah. in races, just to increase the number throughout the year. Um, and it's a low target, but you know yeah. <laughs> you've got to start somewhere. Really, um, have you found that those environments ultimately are welcoming to you, or is it um, is it more of a um, kind of an awareness. Um, it's kind of a chicken or an egg type of conversation, right? Where it's like, do you when you go to a to a trail running group, do you feel welcomed as you, or do you feel like you're not welcomed, or is it that just there's not enough awareness of of these trail running groups amongst a certain community? I think it's just, it just comes down to perception. So to answer your question, look, anyone could sign up to a race. You could get on a train. You could go to Scotland. You go to Wales. You can run. You can do what you need to do. There's no like barrier that says you're black. What are you doing here? Yeah, th- th- that's not, not what we're suggesting. Um, you're going to get a couple people that I think you know I can do this by myself. You know, fine. They go and do the races, but then there's going to be the other type of person that's like, well. You know, I don't see anyone that looks like me. I feel really self-conscious outside yeah. of my natural environment, which isn't t- tends to be, say, an urban environment. So I don't want to be in this place. So you kind of need to be supportive and mindful of those people's lived experiences, which is where we're coming from. So it's not that, you know, there's actual, you know, measures in place which is stopping people from running. It's more yeah. of a feeling, uh, and that's something you can't always quantify. Yeah. So we're kind of just trying to work how can we break down that feeling but then how can we work with the wider running community to make it seem like we're all working together which is what we want to do yeah because ultimately you know my question is is like if if you're a trail running group um you can be as welcoming you know arms wide open right but it doesn't change the fact that when you marcus go to that group or that race or that you know whatever that saturday afternoon run if you're not seeing, you know, people that look like you, that may make you feel uncomfortable. And so it's that sort of like, obviously the two sides have to be working together in terms of, I have to be very arms wide open welcoming. But then on, on the other side is, is we need to get more people of all, you know, shape, sizes, colors, et cetera, out to those races so that everybody feels, because I mean, like, the most welcoming, amazing groups of people I've ever met were mountain bikers and trail runners. You know, it's like, it's, yeah. it's very, very welcoming, but it's, it's like, how do you kind of get that egg side where you get the people to the place? Cause I think the, the environment is already welcoming. It's just about sort of, you know, meeting it in the middle, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think, I think the environment, it's not like, prohibited but i think it's it's like in life like you always have to ask questions of yourself like you might say am i working towards my 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 goal or you know whether that's family financial whatever and then this is like organizations i think organizations and clubs need to ask are we doing enough to make you know people that don't feel represented feel welcome here yeah 
you know, just to check what are they doing the right things. And, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing. And it's no one saying like, you just do this one thing and then we're all going to be like skipping to the sunset, holding hands, <laughs> singing Kumbaya. Yeah. But it's more just like, uh, look, let's look at, uh, let's, let's look at our group of runners. You know, what do we see? Okay. If it's more white, then it's fine. Okay. But then let's, how can we then make an effort to try and make people that are non-white? You know, feel comfortable in this group. What steps are we making to, you know, welcome our doors to to other people? And yeah. you know, that's where we sort of talk about. That's the the subtle side of just like we're talking about the welcoming side. It's yeah. not prohibitive in terms of like it's actually said, but it's more the unsaid things, unfortunately. Yeah. And you know, you look at many, you know, running groups. You know, they'd be white, unfortunately. You know, the majority. So I mean, we're not trying to say like we want to make it a black majority or anything like that, but we're just trying to say like, look, we just want to make it like a natural part you know where everyone feels welcome yeah it, it's maybe a European idea but you know we, we kind of want to make it feel like people can feel like it's their space as well yeah again I, you know i suspect there's more um uh we are far closer than we think on both sides of this issue in terms of you know running clubs wanting more diversity just because diversity is typically good, right? Being exposed to different cultures is why people move to cities and things like that. And it's, it's a good thing. Um, the, um, well, I forgot my question. Oh, the, I was going to ask, like, do you see anybody doing this well, whether it's in the UK, whether it's certain brands where, because there's also the fine line between sort of a, a pandering type of message that can go really wrong. Right. Um, and so have you seen anybody who's doing it well and can be a model for other, whether they're run clubs or brands or whatever that were like, yeah, that feels totally welcoming and natural and normal. I think people are trying to figure out what is the right step. Yeah. I think brands are scared of one hand because they want to be like, let's get a black person in <laughs> and make him the face because then everyone's going to be annoyed and it's changed. I mean, then you don't want to be that token person. Um, and then on the other side, then you've got like, groups that like say black trail runners or whatever and then then your white cat parts think well that's not really a group for me then you're like well how do you make them feel like welcome and a part of it and it's just like i think we get to the stage of now where you know there's been awareness but now we kind of need to move together and work together and i'm probably going off topic here and, and i don't want to make this political but if you read or listen to obama's latest book like he really talks about like the challenges that he had as a black president and how he had to try and integrate, you know, you know, working with black and white and trying to make, you know, everyone work together and the yeah. challenges that he had. And when I listened to that book and I read that book and I was just like, man, like there's so many lessons in that book. I think essentially we all kind of need to be aware of what's happening, but try to work together so everyone feels a part of the conversation. Because I think at some point you can get to the stage of like, you want to be too far down the line and it's like, you know, black child running group, black child running group, black child running group. It's like, okay, you want, white owners is like, oh, I've heard this enough. Like, I get it. You, you can go out into trails. Like, yeah. we're over this now. But I think, you know, there's, there's a there's give and take from both sides. I think it's just trying to make people aware of what the situation is, but then making everyone feel part of that conversation and that they've got a part so no one feels excluded or something's been taken away from them or whatever. So I think it's a real fine balance. And I haven't got the answers, but I think this year has been more about highlighting but then i think we need to kind of move from that space into more of a collaborative relationship in terms of like how can we work with brands uh, clubs you know to kind of make it normal part of conversation so like for example if i'm it being featured in something i don't want to be like oh there's a black guy one as well for example i don't want to be that guy i just want to be like oh like we're speaking to you now like oh marcus he ran from 455 down to 256 and did this like that's my thing of like yeah like you know, just try to make it a normal part of the conversation and the, the colour aspect is out of it unless someone told you, which, are, which I've told which now. Which, but, you know, that, that's the kind of way that I would like to kind of move moving towards. But, you know, I think we're all trying to figure it out, basically. And I think collaboration, you know, teamwork is so key. But, you know, but we need to sort of see each, each side and uh, be respectful of each, each person's position at the same time. Cool. Well, if you want to get involved, go to um, blacktrailrunners.run. Definitely check out the Checkpoint um, podcast from the Black Trail Runners, sponsored by North Face. Um, some really good conversations. You know, I think this is, again, you and I talked a little bit about some of the the positives that have potentially come out of 2020. And I think the discussion around 
um, race and things and, and sort of just forcing it to the forefront where it's like, you know, whether it's uncomfortable or not, just having the conversations like, you know, like there are any other conversations because these are things that we all, I think, I think the vast, vast, vast majority of people want to figure these things out and want to put some of these things behind us as just sort of matter of fact types of, of things. And so, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll definitely try to do our part to, you know, have those conversations and, and figure these things out as we go through. It's like a, it's like, I want to use a running analogy. It's like <laughs> when you do like a hard workout, a hard session, you know, it, it's really, it's really tough, but then you do it again and do it again. And you're like, okay, well I know it's coming. Yeah. It's like these hard conversations. You know, we, it's, it's painful at the start, but then once you've, you've got through that, that initial pain barrier, you're like, well, it's just, I'm still here. I'm still alive. I haven't died. Yeah. I can still, I can still keep going. Well, and these are, you know, I mean, talk about cathartic um, things in life. I mean, any conversation that I've ever had around this topic with different people over the years, they always, there's always a level of catharsis that comes out of it where you realize, again, it's usually that you realize you're, you're either a lot closer than you thought or you're totally blind in an area, right, where you just don't realize what the other person is even seeing, and then, you know, then it gives you that common ground to be able to come and say, okay, wow, I couldn't have even, I couldn't have even conceived of your perception of that thing or your position on that subject. And now I see what you're seeing. And so it gives you a play, a, sort of, a, again, like a common ground to attack the, the problem in. Yeah. And it's, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's like, sorry, you know, in, in some ways it's almost like, um, you know, it's like, a, a, you know, like. I don't know what the the right analogy, but it's like, you know, getting up the nerve to talk to a girl at a bar kind of thing, you know, like it takes forever. But then once you start that conversation, it's all great. It's kind of the same thing. It's like there's no reason why either side should be so nervous to just <laughs> have these conversations. And, you know, it's a little bit different, you know, having them, you know, out in public on a podcast or whatever else it is. And one side might say something stupid or insensitive, but it's Again, from my experience, it's rarely from a place of like trying to be hurtful. It's maybe just ignorance or naivete or whatever the word is, right? Yeah, absolutely. And like you don't know what you don't know. And like you said, sometimes you need to hear things from other people's experience. And like I'm not sitting here perfect again. Like I, I you know, I, I, I'm I'm immune to kind of that sort of side because, like for example, I don't I don't know what it's like to be a black woman. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, just because my brother's a black woman doesn't mean I understand what it's like to be a black woman. And us as runners, like you say, two men, like for example, we don't know what it's like to run as a female running. Do you know what I mean? And some yeah. levels of harassment that women have to face. Yep. Like I did a series of my podcast and I spoke to women about it. You just don't realize like how common it is and how it's just big. Like you know, women sort of shrink themselves to like this thing. This thing is like a normal part of behavior, but it's not. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to go on a tangent, but essentially, like, you just don't know what you don't know. And the same, just like, same for men. Like, we didn't, I just didn't know that until I had this, this conversation this year. So I think we all can, you know, do better. And, and I'm not sitting here from my black trail runners, like, glass house throwing stones at people because I'm like, look, we, we all can do better. Of course. Yeah, we can, look, people. we can all be better brothers and husbands and sisters and mothers and, and, uh, white and black neighbors and Hispanic neighbor. Yeah, we can all be better. And that's kind of the point is one, you can't be better until you start having those conversations and just, and, and having them open from both sides. And so, um, you have to, you have to be willing to have some grace and allow the person across from you to say something stupid without, killing them, right? You know, not not literally, but you know, figuratively killing them in the conversation. People are going to say dumb things as we all try to figure these things out and so again, have some grace. I think you said that a little while ago. So, um that's an important. You you used the phrase um in our original call regarding the black trail runners um was you can't be what you can't see. And I loved that. I didn't know if that came off the top of your head or if that was sort of like a motto of the of the community, but, um, you can't be what you can't see. I thought was great. That was really like, it paints a perfect picture. Yeah. I mean, I can't claim that as something I've come up with. I mean, it was said before me, yeah. <laughs> this whole black life matters movement. So, um, yeah. And this sort of goes back to sort of what we're talking about, like, especially for kids or whatever, like you, you sometimes forget like how powerful it is. If you don't see someone that looks like you, 
how it limits your perception of what you can be. Like, for example, to putting that to one side, like how many pe- black families you see like camping or and the outdoor spaces in like advertising. Yeah. So as a kid, you grow up thinking, "I oh, just white people just doing it. It's, it's not for me." So we're kind of that's where it kind of leads to. So, like you said, like we are. You know, we're not just saying this is going to change the world, but it's one aspect. You know, for people to to sort of change that that dialogue in, the, in their mind and thinking, well, actually, this is not true. You know, why isn't space not for me? And unfortunately, you have to create physical examples of that at this stage, and then hopefully, then it can create a ripple effect to other areas. Yeah, uh, that's well said. Well, we are. Um we can kind of see the finish line across the horizon here. We normally do a little 10, 10 question dash. You want to answer some questions, have a little fun. Okay. All right, here we go. Easy, uh, easy questions, nothing too embarrassing. Just only honest answers apply. So, uh, all right, we're going to start with a question about your gear. What do you, what are you wearing these days? What kind of shoes? Uh, Nike, uh, so infinity or the tempo next percent for like tempo runs out on the next percent for a races. Very nice. Okay. And uh, Tracksmith clothes. <laughs> what was the last one? Tracksmith clothes. Uh, oh, on Tracksmith. Top. Obviously, right. I don't give you the shoes. Obviously, I'm thinking there must be the rest of the stuff as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, next race. <laughs> what are you signed up for next? Uh, Glant for punishment. So I'm going back to Dorney Lake Marathon in spring and uh, hopefully the London Marathon that happens in uh, the end of the next year. Very good. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite sports movie or book? No, not at the top of my head. I could think of. I'll okay. probably think of something tomorrow. I'd be like, "Wish yeah. I said that." Ah, okay. Well, somebody said Rocky Four the other day, which I thought came out of left field, so that was pretty good. Um, what's your favorite race that you've done so far? Um, probably the the last one, Dorney, because I think just the sum of experiences. Wow, look at Dorney beating out all the all those uh, big marathons. Good for you, Dorney. Well, well done. Uh, what's a bucket list race? What's something that? Uh, what's your aspirational? run to come i'd love to run the big sur marathon okay cool let me know when you're going to be out here this way i'll uh, i'll join you in, in uh, california for that awesome uh let's see home stretch song or band on your playlist do you listen to music when you run sometimes i uh not afraid by eminem i love that okay very good great song uh most embarrassing song on that playlist oh, it's gonna be something from the 80s i'm trying to think uh <laughs> Robert Temper, No Easy Way Out from Rocky. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Do you have a pre-race ritual or superstition other than sitting in your hotel going over every last contingency plan? I write um, like um, mantras on my gels. So I, uh, so every like 25 minutes I have got something to to look at. So that's why my only sort of non-negotiable. I love that. I think I might have to adopt that one. Uh, living or dead, who would you most like to share a long run with? Oh my gosh. Um, probably my granddad actually. Um, cause he died when I was about 15 and he yeah. never really got to see me like running. And I know that he would be like, if he was alive, it'd be like so encouraging of me, of me running. So that in a weird way, actually, like sometimes when I'm running, I think of he's running with me, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. Obviously, yeah. From, from above. Uh, that would be, but yeah, that that would that would be my answer. But obviously, it's, it's, always, it's always the way we were on the spot. You're just like, oh, what, who would it be? <laughs> so, uh, all right, man. Well, this might be equally difficult, but uh, final question: What is the secret? There is no secret. <laughs> Whoa, no secret. I love that. That's that's maybe the best answer yet. There is no secret. Good for you. It's got to keep showing up. It work. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks for stopping by. Any uh, parting words that you uh, want to leave our listeners with or anything you want to plug? Thank you, Troy, for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram at the Marathon Marcus, all one word. And as, as we've spoken about, my podcast is A Runner's Life. And yeah, that's how you can find me online. So uh, yeah, that's been it's been great talking to you. Thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I uh, I, uh, I hope you do come out to Big Sur, or maybe I'll maybe I'll go out and do London one of these days, and uh, we can uh, hook up for some training and racing together. Definitely awesome. 
Well, that is the show, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. More people racing more often, having more fun in the process is our mission. Thanks again to Marcus Brown of the Black Trail Runners and Runners Life podcast for spending part of his holiday break with us and talking about running and giving us all the secrets to breaking three hours. Appreciate that one. I'll have to, we'll have to use that one going forward. Uh, the best way to support the podcast is to click subscribe on iTunes or follow on Spotify to be notified of new shows. Share it with anyone you think would enjoy it. Email them, text them, Twitter, Facebook, you get it. Um, and please take just three minutes to give us a quick rating and review on iTunes. We do a special post for each episode on Instagram, so look for the post for episode 25. Maybe we'll move him over to episode 26 to give him his uh, <laughs> his wishes uh, with a picture of Marcus. Uh, um, if you have any comments or questions, we are at Athlinks, or shoot us an email to podcast at athlinks.com. Again, share it with friends far and wide to help us spread the word, and until next time, happy racing, everyone.